allegations of financial impropriety, unremitted funds, tax evasion, thousands of firearms and ammunition said to be missing under the watch of the police. These and more have been brought to light by one potent tool. Its applications are far-reaching in ensuring transparency and accountability in governance. If you want full details about a state's revenues and expenditure, you need a financial statement. But if you want to know if those funds were judiciously used, then what you need is an auditor's report. While the Auditor General's report, which is a public document, may have uncovered infractions by MDAs at the federal level, how well do states open their books for public scrutiny? A recent report by civic organization Paradigm Leadership Support Initiative, PLSI, ranked Bainui, Lagos and Zamfara states as the lowest three in its sub-national audit efficacy index based on the following audit practices. How accessible their full audit reports are to the general public, how up-to-date and accessible the audit legal framework is, the effectiveness of the State Assembly in reviewing the report and correcting anomalies, and citizen engagement among others. And so we set out to verify some of these findings. We begin in Lagos, which is ranked 35th according to the index. We sought to find out how easy it is to access the audit report and legal framework. For the legal framework, which has been amended and signed by Governor Babajide Sonwolu in 2021, we visit the State Library, but no luck. Next was the State High Court Law Library, where we found an older version, the 2011 Audit Law. The most recent law we got was the 2015 law at the Gazette office. The office promised to reach out when the latest law is available. For the 2020 audit report itself, we head over to the Auditor General's office since we couldn't find it on their website. Without public access, it is difficult to know exactly how much is generated by Lagos State agencies. The Auditor General presents us with the report and responds to the queries. The need to be there to ensure that the Supreme Audit institutions post these things, the audit uh, reports, online. Then to the State Assembly, where laws guiding audit are made. The House is on recess, but we're able to speak with the Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee. For all this thing, it's supposed to go through the internet, but I want to assure you, go to all the ministries, uh, parastatus, MDO, you will see the report there. He insists the latest laws are available, contrary to what we found at the State's Gazette office. In as much the law has been, as, has been asked by the governor, it has become a public document. The PLSI says it reached out to all the states of the Federation to carry out this report, but the case of Zamfara is quite peculiar. Last year's telecoms shutdown in the state is said to have hampered efforts to reach the Auditor General who insists that the 2020 report is publicly accessible. To say that our report is not being accessed by the public is not true. For anyone that wants CDC our report, here is our web address, www.auditorgeneral.zm.gov.ng. We visit the website, and what we find is the 2019 audit report. For Benue State, which was ranked last, the Commissioner for Finance, the DG Planning Commission, the Auditor General and the SSG declined comment. PLSI recommends, amongst other things, that states without an open government structure should adopt one to foster civic involvement in governance. When a road is constructed in your, in your community and then it breaks down three months after, I think we should blame the auditor. In the audit report, you have notes, you have report of the auditors against the spending. And whether those spendings, are, like I said, have complied with relevant provisions of the law, and who has flouted what, and whether funds have not been accounted for, and what institution needs to do what in recovering funds from those that have not accounted for funds. Well, so much attention is focused on the federal government, and rightly so. But then there is a lot happening at the sub-nationals, just the states, and even the local government levels. If only we could engage more. Or from the Lagos State House of Assembly here in Alausa, Ikeja, Lagos, Kayode Okikulu, 
for Channels Television News. Well, just as you say, two gentlemen join us this morning to discuss transparency and accountability. I should actually add Kyle to the list, but especially since he also went to town. But let's stick with the people <laughs> that we have here. Um, Adetu Kumbo Mumini is the Executive Director of Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP. Thanks for joining us this it's morning. It's a pleasure being here. As well as Shewon Igmede, Co-Founder and Director, Budget. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure being here today. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, let me begin with you, uh, Mr. Mumini. The battle for transparency and accountability in governance and public office has been a long one coming. Way before the Auditor General's report started 2011, 2012, thereabouts. So, but this is where we are now. And I know that your, uh, your own uh, agency, your own organization, you've taken time over the past few years to analyze and bring out the issues from some of the auditors, auditor, auditor general's reports, the federal auditor general's report over the years. Uh, uh, the challenge for me has always been a report comes out and we wait how many years before any action is taken. Uh, so what then, the question would be, is the essence of having the reports if no action will be taken. <clears throat> Thank you very much. You see, the problem that I see with the Nigerian nation is the problem of not being true or alive to what the Nigerian government says I undertake to do. You see, the general is not just a common civil servant. It's a top civil servant. And he knows, he, he, he pries into activities of government departments. And a responsible government should take the Auditor General's report very, very serious. Because that is the basis for talking about accountability and, and transparency. If the Auditor General issues a, if the General issues a report, it is not a report issued by SERAP. It is not a report issued by budget. It's a report by the government. So a government should take its report serious. A government should take its report sacrosanct. What would make it look to you that government is taking it seriously? No. When the, when the Auditor General identifies certain gaps in the financial activities of ministry, then the government should take it upon itself to examine that gaps seriously and take corrective measures, whether in terms of discipline, whether in terms of blocking the gaps that the, 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 the general has identified. So that is what responsibility is. But you don't think that's happening at all? No, 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 no. no. no, no. You see, when the, when the general issues a report, it takes ages for the government to react to it. That should not be what we should be facing. Well, we'll talk more on that uh, yeah, in, in the course of the conversation. Mr. Nibide, well, one can guess that the Auditor General is not the only, the Auditor General's office is not the only one that is supposed to take on that responsibility, or is it? Um, thank you so much. And like uh, Mr. Abdul said, um, the Auditor General is a very critical element in the chain of public finance. Um, you would find out that um, right from when you have the budget in its conceptual stage, um, the final appraisal and evaluation of use of public resources um, comes at the level of the Auditor General itself. Um, and if that person is not taking um, with all seriousness, um, shows you that there's a fundamental flaw 
in the use of public resources. Uh, why else you have the accountant general, who is more like the government's um, account officer or account manager, and the auditor general is to validate that and to ensure the, all, the, all the reports and to be sure um, that uh, public resources have been optimized for, for public good. So the, the general is the completion, in my own view, on the entire chain of public finance review. Um, and the report should be taken seriously. Two problems here. One is that the Auditor General has not been granted independence as much as she should get or she should get. Um, so we have that challenge significantly in Nigeria where our audit laws, even at the federal level at the state level, do not get um, significant autonomy to the auditor's office. So they could be underfunded, they could be defunded, and nobody takes a critical look at their statutory constitutional um, or responsibility. The second thing you um, see is also that there is no punitive element that's a follow-up on to this report. Um, no one is checking this report, nobody's punishing anybody, no one is going to jail, no one's facing the law as it should be when the government, uh, when this audit report comes out. It looks nicey, bulky document that just gathers dust to shelf. That's why you see that a lot of times most people even uh, have uh, object to posting this of these reports to uh, full public use by putting them online because they just don't want the significant scrutiny that, that such a report can present. Uh, you know, lots of threads to follow here. I, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I heard of a, an auditor general who is literally begging for funds to print the report. Mm -hmm. So just imagine how much, how much challenge the auditor general would have. But so we don't lose people here, because this is a very, very important topic, I, I imagine. Why should people be interested in this conversation? So, so I'd like us to maybe uh, you know, link up the conversation, because when people hear MDAs, just imagine, oh, that's government's business, OK? It's not our business. But why should people be interested in what's going on at the ministries, department, agencies of, 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 of the government, at all levels, by the way, federal, uh, state, and you know, other breakdowns? It's simple. One thing we must realize is that public resources are finite and public resources have a significant interest competing for it. So you have private interest of politicians, standardpreneurs, contractors competing with public interest in terms of service delivery of roads, schools, hospitals. So there's always that tug of war. Um, either it could be a markup you know, on public resources that is going to line in the private pocket or that is being diverted from some political or personal benefit. Um, so if citizens are not agitating or being or questioning or being curious or being involved in how public resources are spent, they would lament, they will agitate, they would cry about how um, service delivery is poor in their community. Oh, our road is poor, schools is poor, hospitals is poor. But because we are not ensuring that these issues uh, get to the front burner of government. So when given there is loose money in government or something, they divert it to personal, for personal benefit. It's extremely important that citizens understand that the only way to get service delivery to happen in their communities is to be able to really stay on top of the issues in terms of what are the needs of the community and how are they using all the all the channels, including uh, talking to their representative, including writing letters, including engagement, including tweeting, and doing every single element to show that these public resources will work for them. And that's when you know these things can sound very very theoretical, like oh, um, it's not our business. I have other things to do. But when we look around us, um, it's all about public authority and use of public resources. These are critical powers that have been kept in the hands of those who have been elected into office or have to even manage the country. The citizens themselves have to rise up and understand that it's critical as part of their social contract. Demand and relentless agitation for effective and resources is how change happens in our communities and in our lives. So uh, essentially, we sh our citizens should see it as our money, not government yeah, money. Essentially, it's not, it is it's not government money. It's, it's our money. money. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let, let me come to Mr. Momoni because I know you do a lot of engagement, not just with other civic societies, journalists, but with the people as well, try to break these things down. And, and I, I'd like you to speak to us about just how well you have seen or noticed that people are aware of these rights. Because it's your right, essentially, to have access to this information, to know how your money, our money is being spent. But what have you found out about people's attitude generally? You see... We are on the 
road or path to it. But I don't believe that Nigerians are demanding enough. Nigerians are not asking sufficient questions. For example, a particular amount is de dedicated to roads in your area. You know that this was what, what was budgeted for. But either the roads are poorly constructed or they are not constructed at all. So it is your business to put people that you have elected to task. Ask the person that you sent to the House of Assembly states. Ask the person that you have sent to the House of Representatives at the federal level. Ask your senators what is happening. So until those questions are constantly and seriously asked, we have seen that um, the government that have already always been in place in Nigeria don't take the citizens serious. But they will only take citizens serious if there is persistent, consistent, and cogent request by the people as to how these resources let me, have let me, been. Let me cite an with. example of how sometimes um, uh, it will seem like some government officials gaslight or give the people <laughs> the runaround. Um, Cardi, for instance, went to town. Uh, he may be able to ask, he will be able to ask some questions based on his experience. But you also listened to that report where uh, I think it was a lawmaker that was saying if we go to a particular place, we'll find something. Uh, but you, he actually went back to this ministry, department, or agency. And he was literally giving the runaround. Then that, I think it was another state, I think it was Zamfara, that said, go to a particular website, you will find a particular document. He went to that uh, you know, particular place. What he found wasn't what he was promised there. So uh, if people continue to get this runaround, people have a lot of things to do. A lot of money. I mean, they, they, we all know what the economy is like, you know, popular um, employment figures, poverty figures, and all of that. So if people continue to get this kind of run around. We are the media. We may have the resources to go around because it is our job. Yeah. But it is not the job of the people per se because they have some other things to do. So in that regard, what, how do we engage? Uh, uh, please, let me, let me correct this impression. Let me say, this is my money. Let's leave government out of it for a moment. This is my money. I believe that every Nigerian who thinks I have my money will not allow somebody to fritter it away. So don't let us see this government business as their business. I have some other things to do. To me, that is seriously defeatist. When you look at other other countries where things are going on properly, you see that that approach is not the approach they adopt. When you look at other African countries where representatives are responsive and responsible, you see that that is not the, the Nigerian approach is not the, the right approach that they adopt. So to now say uh, it is their business, have some other things to do, is to me considering the space to Nigerian. I, uh, I, government I, establishment. I hope you understand my point. Yes. I'm not saying it is not important to follow it up. Yes. It is. But, you, I mean, Cardi, do you have the cash now? No, I don't have the cash now. Case settled. Answer received. Mm -hmm. But you go to an officer. Do you, we, I need this information. Oh, go to a social person. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, okay, you go to that person. Ah, oh, look, it's with social person. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that your bad thing that they call Arodon? Okay. Like, giving you the run around and all that. Yeah. That's the point that I'm making. L let me, it's like Nigerians are not ready to use the series of opportunities that have been made available by law. Okay. For example, there is this Freedom of Information, information Act. It says, when you need... You don't, have even, you don't have, even have to say the basis for your need for an information. It is compulsory that they give you once you request for it. It's not a question of what do you want to use it for. That has been settled by judicial authorities and by law itself that says information must compulsorily be given by any government establishment. In the case of the report that we played to you, when there was Benway State that didn't respond at all, right. 
what do we do? You see, if you cannot proceed upon that litigation yourself, you can get in touch with people at Sarah. You see, and you see, a lot of people think we just litigate for litigation's sake. No. You see, we litigate to effect and for purpose. When the law says this is the law, it is part of our general business to make the law work. And how can we make the law work? It's by testing the law. When you take physical effort to test the law and the law is not working, then the only available method for you to do it is to, go, to do it by legal means. Okay. L let me ask uh, uh, Mr. Odebide. Well, you may want to speak to those issues that have been raised already, but I want to ask you about the effort that your organization has made to confirm that certain budgetary spendings actually achieve what was intended. What are some of your findings? Uh, you know, uh, Kaede was just asking that same question about, you know, how, how do people follow the money, so to speak. In your own, uh, you know, movements around trying to verify that spendings match budgets, what are some of the reactions you've gotten from people in the various environments? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and like, uh, um, you know, the Sarah executive director mentioned, Mr. Mumini, um, the, the critical problem is that we don't have a social contract in Nigeria as we should. Um, we run a country uh, where um, citizens don't understand their rights uh, to accountability as much as possible. And, and also because um, taxation paid directly to government, citizens are taxed all around, but the taxation paid to government um, is grossly weak. Um, so that's where we have a first challenge. We have a society where citizens don't know that, like I said, it's not government money. Um, you know, it's public money and it's the public commonwealth. And every single penny, every single cent uh, is meant to be fully accounted for. And that's the kind of situation we don't have. Um, and most times when we have reached out, we have an outreach program called Tracker that helps us do service delivery work. So we track projects in about, uh, 1,600 communities in Nigeria. And when we work on those communities, worse, they, there's always this shock element where people don't even they can't even imagine that there is a project in their community that is in the budget when we sensitize them or engage them. So there's always that shock. They can't even believe it that someone nominated the project in their local community. Now, you now have a situation even when you're trying to push the community to do the right thing. Some are excited to do. Some will tell you they're excited, but by the time they call maybe the House of Rep member or the State House of Assembly member, um, they will say, oh, he's our son, he's our daughter, we'll handle it our way. Or some might even tell you that um, um, you, are you, do you have political interest or are you here to um, harass or abuse or to put us at in, in some of disagreement with the elected official? Um, very, very clear to us that there's gross um, gap. There's a huge gap when it comes to civic education in Nigeria, people understanding their rights um, under the law. Um, we have the Fiscal Responsibility Act, the Freedom of Information Act, even the Constitution guarantees access to information on all of these things. But the challenge we have is that, like uh, Mr. Abdul said, the, 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 the law is one side. Um, how do people even rise up and ensure that um, the, the, the law is delivered or is, or is tested to, to deliver results for Nigeria? So we, we still see that the basic civic education for people understanding their rights and understand that people in public office serve at their pleasure is still not there in terms of in terms of access. So we've done our work in the last uh, 10 years to bridge this gap. We've reached over 20 million Nigerians. We have presence in around 16,638 communities. We are in almost uh, two-thirds of local governments in Nigeria. We've tracked over 18,000 projects um, across the country. Uh, we've done all that work to ensure that we give citizens that information. But like I said, there's still significant gap when it comes about citizens on their own self-enlightened uh, situation holding government accountable effectively. Um, and we've even seen pushback, everything. Sometimes you see citizens, fellow citizens, 
on social media, you know, thinking that you're doing too much, you're asking too much questions, um, you're proving that you are the know it all and you don't understand in quotes the Nigeria's um, um, factor in all of this. Things. Whereas it should not be so. Um, you know, and that is also linked to how you see that the ostentatious life of public office soldiers in Nigeria is grossly divergent um, from the from what an, how an average Nigerian lives. If you're a member of parliament in the UK, you earn around eighty thousand pounds. That's like a you know a, a decent average worker in the UK might fall in being be, uh, within that bracket in some sort of way. So you are not earning something outrageously um, different from what an average person. But that's not what you see as a lawmaker or anybody in Nigeria. Someone gets into public office and is, is buying the wagon in three months. You, you begin to wonder, you know, how does that come to be? Yeah. Well. Uh, lots of issues, really, and, and I'm quite excited about this topic because, you know, speaking to government officials, you realize that sometimes the, inf the information is actually there, just lying fallow. And, you know, they say that if you want to hide anything from a man, <laughs> keep it in a book. I'm not saying the saying as it is, I'm just saying it generally, you know. And that's what they say, just put it in a book and they'll just literally overlook it. And I I'd like you to speak to this point because there's this mindset, I imagine, this... Uh, Kabiosi, let me just use that Yoruba term. Don't ask questions as it were. And you talked about it, the ITK, you are too, no, okay, just calm down. So a lot of people just have that mentality. I shouldn't ask questions from government. One, I am an average citizen. This man has, you know, policemen around him, has cars, you know, he's a big man. His Agbada flows all the way. So how do we deal with that mindset? Because there's that timidity on the path of people to go ahead and ask, go to the offices, write letters, follow up. How do we deal with that mindset? It will take a while because it's a residue of the military regime. Um, that's the first problem we have. Um, we and, and that miseducation is on both sides. It's on the side of the government. It's also on the side of, of the citizens. Um, so we have that, uh, we still believe that... Uh, we still can't question those in authority. Sometimes we're even calling people in power. <laughs> we even understand that power actually belongs to the people. You know, people in authority, that's how I prefer to call them. It's extremely important that uh, people recognize their power as a collective and are able to exercise it uh, effectively. Because that is the central tenet of democracy. You can build roads and bridges in, the democratic, in an autocratic system. Um, but what makes the way you call it democracy is that well, without any level of fear, it's subject to public inquiry and the rights of minorities are also equally protected. That's why you call it a democracy. So, and that's the first problem. Second thing is a social contract that does not exist. Um, in a society where um, the taxation system is well structured and citizens are active participants in the revenue profile of the country, um, you will see that a lot of people get agitated on, on simple things, on little things, and say, you're wasting my money, you're wasting my taxes. But we, as a country, uh, the Nigerian government, because of our, you know, our history with high revenues, we have not deliberately built a social contract with Nigerians. And the social contract is not about taking taxes, it's also about giving back. You know, you saw, we saw how much was spent you know, in supporting citizens directly, direct, and I'm not talking about supporting a few people, supporting a whole lot of citizens in, in, in developed countries because it's not just about giving, it's also about government being responsible back to them. So we have also not been deliberate around building an effective social contract, which is why we don't even have enough trust in government because how am I paying you taxes? And I'm walking barefooted, and you are driving um, in free flow in Agbada. They don't even look like the problem of the country. So those are the kind of challenges that we, as a people, have not mastered to say we have to challenge public, public authority. So it's a mindset, it's a mindset that will take uh, a, a huge scale of education to correct that citizens can just be citizens, and it doesn't even just end you voting. You need to actively be involved in governance. You need to hold government accountable. You need to write letters. You need to understand the role of your representative at the state and federal level, that they are the people that should oversee projects in your local community, and they have primary responsibility, that those projects are properly done. Um, you need to also look at quality of being done. We've seen schools, roads, you know, being built, and within six months, they collapse. And you are asking questions, and the contractor believes that he has done his best. No one in the ministry is doing an evaluation of the project. So those are the kind of questions that we need citizens to be more attractive. And those are not just civil society, faith-based organizations, traditional rulers, you know, community development associations. 
We need that communal level of investment in, in public and sector accountability. It's only when we do that that we can get results, not just about saying we're voting money and we're voting money. Everybody okay. can spend money. You know, we we're, we're, we're due for a break in, in about three minutes or less, and I'd like both of you to take this point uh, quickly. So I realize that they are auditor, uh, auditors general for federal, state, and even local mm. governments, interestingly, yeah. right? Most people focus on the federal auditor general. But tell us this, how, as a citizen, do I need to approach this whole getting access to information, knowing how my money is spent? Just give us a quick citizen's guide. Where do we start from, perhaps at the local or government level, state? How do we go about this? So where you start from is, uh, I believe you should start from at the state level. Um, well, fortunately, our local government system has been heavily compromised. We should have actually have been the closest to the people. And I say, start with budget. Um, reach out to us, email us, message us, um, engage us, and ask for your project. Or even go to the budget um, to your state. We have a website called openstates.ng. You'll find all the budgets of all the states in there on that platform. you find all the audit reports of all the states on that platform. Even if you go to the website of PLSI, um, very great work they've done with this audit report. You see all the audit reports in there. Download it, read it, you know, bring excerpts out. And to you say know, that these general. states... Pardon me, is that to say that these states don't have the information on their own website? Because I know states have websites as well. Is that to say they don't have it there? A lot of states have it there, but you're going to go to six or nine or ten pages, buried in one last corner of the world before you can find out information. It's always not ready to be available. Some states also do have. Um, recently, there was a World Bank project called SIFTAS, and that mandated, not mandated, it provided some incentives for states to be much more transparent and accountable, um, giving them money on a yearly basis. That project ended this year. So we are even watching. I mean, after that project has ended, our citizens or our states going to continue in the, tra in the, in the tradition, and you know, that's happened in the last few years, of publishing some of this information. But you find that when you're looking for public financial reports, these are the most difficult things to find. You know, look at the website in Zamfara. Nobody knows that website exists, it's, you know, that is some sort of way. You wouldn't even find it easily anywhere, except you go to the ministry and you are knocking the doors. And how many people are going to knock the doors? We need to build, uh, we need to see public access to use of public resources as a statutory issue. You know, you don't exist in government for yourself. You exist for the people and you serve at the pleasure of the people. It's something that we need to knock into the air, not just on the side of citizens, but also on people who govern Nigeria, because that is the only way that we can actually say we exist in a democracy. I mean, Rwanda builds roads. Everybody builds roads, but do we do it in a way that people can inquire and be able to get answers in the, okay. without fear of failure? Yeah. Well, Mr. Onibide, we're due for that break now. So we've got in your, yeah. at least your, some part of your citizen's guide. We'll come back and get Mr. Momoni's side, that citizen's guide to getting, you know, access to information. Plus, we need to make this conversation, this topic, you know, we need to tie it to the 2023 election and make it some sort of a big deal because, hey, why make promises you can't fulfill? So please stay with us. I think it's no coincidence we're discussing transparency and accountability in governance on this World Press Freedom Day. I mean, you can't have the fourth estate of the realm if you don't have, you know, the, I mean, in medieval times, right, the Lord's Temporal, the Lord's Spiritual, and the Commons, right? So there will be no press without all of those other three estates working together. And just before the break, we were speaking with uh, Mr. Onigbide, Shego Onigbide of Budget, and he was giving us a citizen's guide. But we have uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Shio Onigbide, pardon me. But we have Mr. Adetoku Momomuni right here in our studio. So let's hear your version of a citizen's guide uh, to getting access to information. What do I do as a citizen if I want to know what exactly is going down in government? <clears throat> Let me say you start from the point of view of getting interested in, for instance, who you sent to the legislature, getting interested in the person who you asked to sit on the executive chair as the governor or as the president. Get that? Then the next thing will be know that laws exist. Even before the Freedom of Information Act, the Constitution has said every information must be supplied by government. That is given. 
freedom of that only concretizes it to say you don't have to start asking questions like, are you a lawyer? What do you want to do with this? No. That is not, a, this is not the business of anybody that you are asking for information to be, to be asking you such silly questions. Mm. Now, when you, you have that conception, you see, the conception you must have must be that there is a provision that you can access information. And once you access the information, now, scrutinize that information yourself and see whether the information that you have tallies with what the government has promised you mm. in terms of, I'll provide for this, I'll provide for that. Then when that does not align, then start asking questions. Will it help? Uh, you, you said something the other time, just before we throw this to Abuja to Malpoy. Will it help the citizen, for instance, to know that he contributes at least 86,750 naira to the budget of 2022. I say that because, well, the budget has, the budget passed 17 trillion, 350 million, 350 billion naira. And if we go by the 200, 200 million speculation, speculated population, population of Nigeria, Nigeria, I would divide that. That's something 86,750. Naira. Will it help the Nigerian watching us and listening to you right now to know that he needs someone to account for the money he has put in the till? Very well now. You see, I think that is what the media people should be doing. Concretize this money for Nigerian people. Let them feel that it is their duty to make provisions for this amount of money and they must be properly and effectively spent. That is very, very important. It okay. will assist. Okay. Malcolm. Well, let me first of all say Eid Mubarak to you, Mr. Momoni. It's good to see you in our studios in Lagos. And uh, Thank special you. greetings to you as well, Shimu, um, in the U.S. I would like to congratulate you because I understand that budget is now in the U.S. Perhaps you could shed a bit more light on that. Uh, I have questions for both of you gentlemen. First, let me ask uh, you, Mr. Mumuni. Uh, you know, my colleague Ayo did take you up on the fact that a lot of Nigerians are busy and that much as they'd like to really do this, there's also the existential question of, you know, getting about daily duties. In the meantime, the Constitution has provided that our lawmakers have the function of uh, not just lawmaking, but also oversight. They are the ones who, uh, you know, pass the budget eventually, and they have oversight functions. There's also a special committee, the Public Accounts Committee, which is supposed to be headed, or which is usually headed by members of the opposition party because they believe that they ought to be able to hold to account uh, those in the executive arm of government without any fear or favor. After all, they're not beholden uh, to the government um, at the center in their states or at the federal level, as it were. So the, the questions that we should be asking of the Public Accounts Committee um, in the different state governments, um, as we know, and, uh, and as also was revealed by uh, the PLSI report, there are questions as to what happens when almost all members of at the state level uh, are usually from the same party. If they usually, if they have the same freedom um, as the, those at the national level, where you know the opposition is usually quite strong. Uh, so, what would you suggest we do in in the areas where we see that? The legislature is not really living up to its responsibility. We know just how weak legislative activity could be at the, at the state level. What are citizens supposed to, be, to, to do where those who already have responsibility, whose job it is uh, to do what it is that they ought to do, are not exactly living up to expectation? Thank you very much. The, 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 uh, my own position is that the very first thing that must happen is that the people that should represent us, we should ensure that they are responsible and they know what they are in there to do. That is very, very important. When you send 
into the legislature, even if he's a member of the majority party, if he knows and understands what he is there for, then we'll not, we'll, the problem that we will have, we'll be having will start diminishing. It is when the person you sent into the legislature, legislature does not know what he is there for, that is when we start having major problems. You see, it is not, it is, it is not a question of um, competence first. It's a question of commitment. Are you committed to the ideals which your people have sent you into one to propound, or are you on the other side? That to me is very, very important. It is when people are in there, they know what they are supposed to do there. That is a, a, a step in the matter has already been settled. Thereafter, any other things can follow. But when you don't have the right people in the right places, that is when problem starts in my mind manifesting. Well, the story of how, you know, PLSI, you know, start, started to document this is quite interesting. But one of the things um, I found very interesting also is in terms of how states have had to be incentivized to open up their uh, accounts. I know that the World Bank did provide some incentives, uh, 138 point, I, I think it was something close to you know, close to $200 million, uh, which states could get in grants. Uh, of course, I mean, states could draw a little from that. And a lot of states, you know, seize the opportunity and say, oh, if these are the conditions we need to meet, we can meet some of those conditions and, and open up our books and get access to this money. There have been questions as to what will happen when the grants eventually dry up, when, when the period for the grant is over. Will states continue in that method of accountability? So let me ask you, Shemu, uh, because I know that budget is not just in Nigeria now, um, I know that you're in a few other African countries. How would you say that we're doing in terms of transparency and accountability, citizen interest compared with other African countries? Thanks so much, uh, Valpe. Um, um, and I say that we're not doing too well, um, but also not the worst. Um, so, for example, if you take a look at the um, in the uh, International Budget Partnership Report, there's always an open budget report that comes out uh, every two years. Budget is a significant contribution uh, to that work uh, across Africa. And we will see that Nigeria falls even below the sub-Saharan average uh, in terms of our scoring. So in terms of how we, we engage the budget, uh, encourage oversight of the budget issues, or even publish uh, public transparency or making sure that public information is available to the public, we have not met the mark uh, so much as we. Uh, we have countries like Ghana, Kenya, who still do significantly far better than Nigeria, including South Africa, that is we are ahead of Nigeria. Nigeria, in terms of how um, we publish public data. Um, recently, we've improved significantly at the state level, but like as you mentioned, um, the World Bank's uh, CIFTAS program has contributed heavily to that. I mean, we have also contributed to that. Uh, budget helped state government design citizens budgets. Um, we supported um, 35 out of 36 states in Nigeria in doing that. We also even helped um, states in, um, in uh, engaging them how um, they can optimize uh, getting funds from this World Bank program. And like you said, we all have fears. Um, this is not something that should be incentivized in any way. Um, this is something that is uh, statutory, uh, that public resources should be made public. And the use, um, I mean, they are, how they are being used. But we, if we have to come to a point where we have to give money to people to do it, uh, we must ensure that as this is actually changed the culture. And the program has actually ended, technically ended. So this next year, this year budget, this year data might be made public. Next year is when we are going to start looking at, I mean, from budget's perspective, we also want to be intentional and intense to make sure that states continue to publish their budgets. Um, even including the federal government needs to do more in terms of its access to data, uh, budgets, public spending, and not just public, publish, because um, whatever you don't measure, whatever you don't review, then what's the whole purpose? You're just you know, wasting money. Um, you're just abusing public resources. There has to be a continuous audit and evaluation of public reports or public projects. And to ensure that these projects 
are exactly what Nigerians need. Because there's a way you can even spend public money on things that are not necessary. Um, that's the first challenge that we have. Secondly, so evaluate that at least delivered in the right measure as, as, as written maybe in the bill of quantities and things like that. We don't have, the, we don't give enough strength to our audit agencies and it's grossly unfortunate, you know, because we have a public accounts committee. In fact, the senior, current senior president was the public accounts committee during the, the years of PDP, I mean, almost eight years in the National Assembly. And I'm always asking that question about um, what were the rules of the public account committee in those years when, if we said things were not working proper, when the APCs in government and what the chairman of the public accounts committee, what has been his rule? Do we get to see him on the news every day? Is he reviewing all this report? Is he recommending people for prosecution? No, what exactly, I mean, when the constitution and the public account committee is not just, um, it's not just um, a legislative decision. It's a constitutional uh, um, um, committee that will re properly recognize its role in holding government accountable. And those are the structures are there, the laws are there. But what we find is that people just don't stand up to their offices and do what is right. And like you said, a lot of Nigerians are battling with their existential issues. I mean, they have food, they have, they have to leave. We've elected people in public office to do oversight on public projects. Now, we now have to do the second level work to even put those people that we've elected in public office to do their job. And we've seen that happen over time when we even talk to legislators and lawmakers. And it looks like we are just the burden to them. We're not. You know, we're asking you to do what you are, the oversight on projects in your communities. Pay attention to them and ensure that public resources are effective and are optimized as regards that. But the problem in Nigeria is everything is significantly politicized, and people are just people just don't step into the rule as much as possible uh, as as what they should do, and it's just cross the opportunity. I do know that uh, Kayode did say that he'd like to, you know, tie this to the 2023 elections as, a, as is coming. And we know that oftentimes uh, the legislature is where we do not pay as much attention um, as we ought to in terms of those who eventually occupy those offices. And then when they refuse to take questions, only recently uh, a media group, uh, Daria Media in partnership with Channel TV, had this open square engagement. They've been going around different states uh, seeking to engage with lawmakers. And sometimes uh, the engagement, we've, we've seen enthusiasm in some, in some regions. In some other regions, the enthusiasm is very low. I think the, the lowest it recorded was in the Northeast, where only two lawmakers uh, showed up for, for the engagement. So in some instances, it would seem that lawmakers have other priorities. In some other instances, there is a, a very good showing. While Kyle asks you that question, I'll quickly ask you and, and take it back to Lagos. Uh, what do you think that Nigerians should be doing in the case where lawmakers refuse to take questions? Yeah, um, so first is to understand where are their constituency offices. Um, they, we must understand that where exactly are they. And we, I mean, as citizens, we have a right to walk into there and ask questions. Um, we have a right to coordinate us. And then we don't do this alone. Um, when we say power belongs to people, we're not referring to just a person. So organize yourself into like a community and, you know, put yourself on, put your words in the letter, people knock the doors and numbers so that whoever is representing you at that point understands that you have numbers behind you. It's essential for people to do this um, by question and, and also be able to be upfront to people that we are not going to get you reelected. We are going to be very, very deliberate that there will be political consequences for your lack of engagement on these issues. And even if it persists, we can even throw up a situation of recalling. It's just that the way um, the process of recalling uh, lawmakers in Nigeria is, is too difficult, it's, it's a bit challenging. But we must be able to put people in office. We must be able to strike at their incentive, which is the political benefit of those things. I mean, if you have not worked well in overseeing projects in your communities, if you have not um, been engaging with your lawmakers, if you have not also even um, represented us as we expect you to be, then your political position should be up for review. And the citizens have to have to be obvious and clear about this. Um, because we don't run a parliamentary system, we tend to over, um, we focus too much on, 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 on the executive heads. You know, asking Whereas those questions, people, my apologies, Mr. Ringbinde, asking those questions, or rather uh, making this, you know, accountability and transparency thing uh, an mm -hmm. election topic, 
I, I don't know how significantly do you think that will play, especially before the aspirants become candidates of their party? No, I mean, you have, uh, most times in Nigeria now, you have an incumbent, you know, the party will say we're giving automatic tickets to the to the incumbent in some sort of way, maybe to run the second term on the other. But people have a right to reject them at the polls if lawmakers have not done well to represent you effectively. You have a right to coordinate yourself, organize yourself and say yes. And that comes back to the point of Mr. Mumuni. The first framework that we must get right is the quality of people that have been elected in public office. We don't elect the right people in public office, then definitely we are not going to get great results from them. So it's okay for citizens to politicize non-performance and say we are not going to get you re-elected. And the when let the, me when ask the uh, let me yeah, let me ask Mr. Nugin that as uh, beg your pardon, Mr. Mumin, same question before we, we call it today. If transparency and accountability is important to us. We don't know who is going to be a candidate until the political party throws them up. In interestingly, a good number of people who will vote, who will uh, help the aspirants become candidates, are also Nigerians who are in these political parties. Is there any way that political parties can be influenced to make this issue of transparency and accountability, performance in governance, an election issue or a ticket to getting the ticket? It is very important to start talking about performance as a basis for electing or re-electing a candidate for the legislature or even for the executive position. Now, the way I think it should happen is that if a political party sponsors a candidate, the candidate gets elected, and that candidate is not rendering any service or effective service to the people, then that political party should be encouraged and harassed to get that candidate out of the way for a better and more sincere candidate. That's the way I look at it. Let me just hope that every one of them is listening to you right now. <laughs> well, this is this, this definitely an endless conversation yes, because yes. we've been talking about transparency and accountability yes. for a very, very long time. But for now, we have to thank you very much for, for making it to our studio this morning. Aditukumbo Mumini is Executive Director, Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP, joins us here in the studio, as well as Shewo Nigmide, who is Co-Founder and Director, Budget, joins us virtually. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure being here. Well, we take a break now, and when we return, we're looking at that issue that we charted yesterday, and it's on the front pages of the papers this morning. Collapsed buildings. We'll be back.